Okay, good morning everybody if you're out there. Um, we're really interested to know who's um, going to be part of the conference today. So as you join, if you can pop your school name and your country into the chat and we'll write out, uh, we'll, <laughs> we will talk and tell you who is joining us. Uh, we'll put some instructions in the chat and that's the Q&A button like you can see on the screen on how to mute notification sounds because otherwise you'll hear a ping every time somebody posts something in the chat. So in order to do that, if you just click on the three dots in the corner of your screen and then scroll down and click mute notifications. I think we've got Edmondsley Primary School from the UK joining us already and Neville's Cross as well. Lovely to see you. So we'll be starting the conference very soon. We're just waiting for schools to arrive. And during the conference, we're going to be seeing what all of you have been up to over the last few weeks. Um, and we're going to be hearing back from some experts on their views and opinions, and there's going to be an opportunity for you to post some questions to the experts. And we've got New Bransworth with us today as well from the UK. OK, so we've got schools joining us all of the while. So if you've just joined us and um, it's important to mute your notification sound. So if you click on the three little buttons in the corner of your screen, the three little dots and scroll down to click mute notification sounds. And we've got the Ribbon Academy as well joining us from the UK. Hello. During the conference, if you lose the feed at all at any point, please just hit the live button when you return so that you can join us in real time. We are recording at least one of these conferences and we will be putting it on the ECO2 website. So if you lose any of the conference at all, don't worry, it will be there for you to view at a later date. And hello to Year 6 from Catchgate Primary School in the UK as well. So if you've just joined us, if you'd like to pop your school's name and country in the chat by clicking the Q&A button, we'd love to hear who's joining us today. Oh, well, we've got Boban just joined us as well. Hello. Okay, for those of you who are just joining us, um, we're about to begin the conference, but if you lose the feed at any point, just hit the live button when you return so you can view us in real time. If you've just joined us, you might like to mute your notification sounds, otherwise you'll get a ping every time someone posts something in the chat. So if you click on the three dots in the corner of your screen and scroll down and click mute notifications, that should stop you hearing the sounds. We've got Lumley Juniors joined us as well. Hello. Okay, so throughout the conference, there's going to be lots of opportunities for you to communicate with us. We won't be able to hear you, but if you keep putting your questions into the chat, we've got a team behind us who are letting us know what the feed's saying so that we can include any of your questions and queries. Okay, so hello to St Oswald's as well, joining us from the UK. Right, we will get started with our ECO2 COP27 climate conference. So hello, my name is Hannah. I'm from Oasis. And my name is Joanne and I'm also from Oasis. So to start, we will have Rich telling us the agenda of the conference. So what's going to be happening today? Morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Rich Hurst. I'm the Education Advisor for Sustainability for Durham County Council. And one of the Augusts. Uh, I'm delighted you're able to join us today. And this is the second year that we've run these international uh, events supported by Durham County Council, Durham University and OACES. So just to remind you, as, as Joanne said, we are recording these sessions and we'll be putting them up um, or through the OACES YouTube channel and through the Eco2 Smart Schools website. So if you do want to come back and see anything, you'll be able to do that 
a little bit uh, uh, after we finished all three of the conferences over the next two days. So this conference is part of our Eco2 Smart Schools programme, which helps schools in Durham and in the northeast to reduce their carbon emissions and learn more about energy. And it's also part of Durham County Council, which County Council is trying to reach net zero emissions by 2045. So as Hannah said, today will be a mix of presentations, some questions for you to answer, and also really importantly, a chance for you to ask questions of our expert panel who are at Durham University, um, and we'll be able to talk to them a little bit later on. So this year we're focusing on the impact of climate change on habitats and on ecosystems. And you'll be finding more uh, about how climate change is affecting many of the habitats around the world through the climate losses section, which we'll be doing shortly to find out how people around the world right now are able to look at opportunities and to find out how we can change uh, our impact on climate change. And then finally, we want uh, we'll be exploring climate hopes, and that's where we'll be asking you to pledge what you're doing, both in your communities and what you're maybe planning to do to be able to combat climate change. So I really hope that you enjoy today's session and I'm going to hand back over to Joanne and Hannah, where we'll start to talk about climate losses. OK, so we'll just say a quick hello as well to Futures Hagada Language School. It's great to see you here as well. And thank you, Rich, for that introduction. Now we're going to look at some of the work that you've been doing around climate losses. So students from Dar al Tabir in Egypt shared that their local ecosystem in Egypt is a desert and animals such as camels live there. And they've noticed that higher temperatures and less rainfall are leading to more desertification. And you can see the lovely posters and displays that they've created there. OK, then students from Nauru World School have created posters about the difference between weather and climate and how activities are increasing the greenhouse effect. And again, we've got some beautiful displays. Then students from Kosov Lazarus Gymnasium in Hungary learned about feedback loops and how climate change is affecting ecosystems around the world. And you can see on the blackboard there that they've been drawing a feedback loop. And students from CM High School have explored how different ecosystems around the world are being affected by climate change. OK, so it's not just you guys that have been investigating climate change. Scientists from all around the world are looking at it all of the time because it's such an important issue. And we have over 800 scientists, the world's leading scientists, um, working together to produce reports which help us monitor and look at how we can react to climate change. So the most recent one of these reports came out in 2021, so that was last year, and it was added to this year. So they're always adding things when they find out new information. And one of those things the report looked at was climate losses, just like you've been looking at in the lesson you've been completing. And all of the scientists agreed that the world's ecosystems are being affected. And not only that, that some are being more affected than others. So we're going to have a little look at that now. So we've got the Arctic tundra, tropical rainforests, snow forest, otherwise known as the boreal forest, the Arctic coastal wetlands and coral reefs. So the big question that we'd like to throw out to you to answer today is which ecosystem of the ones we've just shown you do you think will be most affected by climate change? And also, oh, so let's learn a little bit more about each one. So the Arctic tundra has a lot of something that is called permafrost. And permafrost is basically soils and rocks and sand underneath the ground that are frozen together by ice and it's permanently frozen together by ice. As our temperature rise, this permafrost melts and that releases gases like carbon dioxide and methane into our atmosphere. Then we have the tropical rainforests and these are under threat from climate change too, because as the world warms, 
these trees are normally used to having a humid atmosphere with lots and lots of moisture in them. And when there isn't as much moisture there and the conditions are warmer, <clears throat> the tree leaves start to wilt. And in worst case scenarios, we have things like forest fires. And forest fires have raged across a lot of the world's rainforests in recent years. So snow forests, otherwise known as the boreal forest, is found in colder parts of the world, but even the snow forest is getting warmer. These forests actually rely on fires to rejuvenate, so to produce new trees, but climate change means that these fires are happening too often, and that's not giving these new trees enough time to grow to form new habitats for animals to live in. And the warmer temperatures are also enabling tree eating insects from further south to travel up to live in the snow forests. And then we come on to the Arctic and the Arctic is basically melting. The temperatures are rising and so the snow and the ice is turning into water. And for the first time since records began on the 12th of July 2012, so that's like over 10 years ago, nearly 100% of the Arctic was melting on the same day, which is a little scary. Rising temperatures mean that summer sea ice is disappearing, and that is a big problem for animals like the polar bear and the walrus. So coastal wetlands are found on the coast, so by the sea. And due to more frequent droughts and storms, coastal wetlands are being damaged. And it's predicted as well that rising sea levels, so the sea getting higher in the future, could also submerge these wetlands. And that's going to cause big problems for the animals that live there. And then we come on to coral reefs. So rising temperatures are causing our seas and our oceans to warm. And increased levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are causing seas and oceans to become more acidic. These two things, higher temperatures and more acidic conditions, are basically destroying our coral reefs. They're bleaching them and causing them to die. So we would really like to know which ecosystem you think is most at risk due to climate change. Now you've heard a little bit about each of the six we've talked about. So please click on the link that is being posted in the chat to cast your vote. So do you think it's going to be the Arctic tundra, the tropical rainforests, the snow forest, the Arctic, coastal wetlands or coral reefs? So if you cast your vote now in the link that's been posted to the chat, you can get to the chat by clicking on the little Q&A button at the top of your screen. So we've had three responses so far, four responses. So we can see the Arctic, oh, a lot of schools think that the Arctic is going to be most affected. I had a vote for the Arctic tundra and coral reefs as well. But so far it looks like the Arctic is what uh, most schools think is going to be the most affected by climate change. We haven't had any votes for tropical rainforest. Oh or snow forests yet. I can see there's even more votes for the Arctic being the most at risk from climate change. Yes, the Arctic is definitely steaming ahead in the votes with Arctic tundra closely following. I think we've still got a few for coral reefs as well. Well done, everybody. So I think the conclusion from that is that most people think the Arctic will be the most affected. 
which I think is a very sensible conclusion. Yes. Now we're going to throw out another question to you, and this is more of an emotional one. So of all of the ecosystems that we've just talked about, which will you miss the most? So if climate change has its way and we're not able to stop it, which one of those ecosystems do you think you would miss the most? So another link is appearing in the chat now so that you can cast your vote again. So remember those ecosystems were the Arctic tundra, the snow forest, tropical rainforests, the Arctic coastal wetlands and coral reefs. So have a little think about what those ecosystems look like in your head and imagine which one you would miss the most. OK, so we'll hand over to you now and you'll probably need to do some class voting. So we can see those results coming in. Oh, so one vote for the tropical rainforest so far and a vote for coastal wetlands as well. And coral reefs. So what we can see from this is everybody has their favourite ecosystems, so we need to make sure that we try and save them. Looks like coral reefs is storming ahead now. OK, so we've got of the responses that are coming in. I think tropical rainforests and coral reefs are tying. Oh, no. Coral reefs are now going ahead again. We've got a vote for the Arctic come in as well. Which habitat would you miss the most, Joe, do you think? Well, I was really lucky in my youth and I visited the tropical rainforest and I think I'd be really sad if they disappeared. And as the lungs of our planet, I think we really need them. Mm. How about you? I think coral reefs mix. I remember watching videos of coral reefs when I was a child and being amazed at all the different colours and animals that um, live there. Lovely. So it looks like everybody's casted their vote. So well done. That's some really interesting results that we can see there. So it looks like everybody agreed with you on that. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's time to meet our expert panel who will be answering your questions today. They're going to be answering your questions on all concerns that you might have over climate losses. So perhaps you've got a question about one of those ecosystems you've just seen or a more general question about climate losses and climate change. So we're going to have a brief pause now for you to post any of the questions that you might have to the panel in the chat. And then once you have done so, we're going to move on to nature versus technology. And in the meantime, all of your questions are going to be gathered by the team that is working away behind us so that we can post them to the chat, the panel in a little bit. Sorry, some slight technical difficulties on my side there, but we've reshared the PowerPoint, so hopefully you can see it. So we'll meet our expert panel now, so they will introduce themselves. Well, hello everyone. It's a real pleasure to be part of this conference today. My name is Douglas Halliday. I work in the physics department at Durham University and I'm interested in solar energy and renewable energy. Good morning everyone, my name is Alan Patrickson. I'm the Corporate Director for Neighbourhoods and Climate Change at Durham County Council. So I'm very much interested in projects that we are delivering here in County Durham in the north of England uh, to help with climate change and also how we can help the county as a whole, including our businesses and our residents to work uh, in a good direction towards a better environment and a better climate. Yeah, hi everyone. My name's uh, Glenn 
McGregor. Uh, I study and teach uh, about weather and climate. I'm particularly interested in the relationship between climate and our health. Hi everybody, my name's Chris. I'm also from the Geography Department and I work on climate change and its impact on glaciers, um, which are those rivers of ice that are in the Arctic and the Antarctic and also in mountain ranges all over the world. So I'm interested in how glaciers are responding to climate change and their impacts on sea level rise. Thank you, panel. So if you haven't already, schools, now is the time to post your questions on climate losses to the fantastic panel of experts that we have with us today. Okay, we've got some excellent questions coming in. Remember, we're just gathering the questions at the moment to ask our panel a little bit later on in the programme. So well done, we can see some really fantastic questions coming in. So keep thinking and keep posting them in the chat. So remember, it's to click on that Q&A button, as you can see on the screen, to post your questions. I think the questions are still coming in thick and fast. So you're obviously working very hard. And there's some very interesting questions coming through as well, yeah. aren't there, Hannah? And we can see we've got questions from the UK and Egypt, so it's fantastic. Keep posting your questions. OK, so now we will move on to our climate solutions. You can keep posting your questions in the chat if you come up with them during this section. OK, so it's not all doom and gloom. There are already a lot of climate solutions out there. But we're going to explore which are the best. Is it nature or is it technology that's going to save us? So hopefully you can see my hat here. I'm team tech and I believe that the answer to climate change is in the hands of humans and technology. And I'm Mother Nature and I've been looking after you all for a very, very, very long time. And I believe that if you help me do my job, I can provide the solutions to climate change. Well, we'll see. I'm going to give some <laughs> technology solutions that I think are better than Mother Nature's solutions. So, for example, they've got kite energy drones. So they found that wind over 500 metres high, so that's really high up in the air, is stronger and more consistent. So we've managed to create an energy drone that's like a mini wind turbine and it floats high up in the air and creates electricity using the wind. They make sure it's attached to the ground by a cable so it doesn't float away. So if you've ever flown a kite, you can imagine what this looks like. And then another technology solution that I think is really good is a solar powered aircraft. So in 2016, Solar Impulse became the first aeroplane to fly all the way around the world, powered only by the sun. And engineers are continuing to build and test solar powered airplanes. So maybe one day passenger planes will be powered by solar. So maybe you'll be going on a solar powered mm -hmm. airplane someday. And my last one is hydrogen buses. So hydrogen can be used as an alternative fuel to power buses instead of petrol or diesel. And hydrogen produces no carbon dioxide when it's used, unlike fuels such as petrol and diesel. And if you've got any taps near you or maybe you've got a bottle of water, you actually find hydrogen in your water. So that's the chemical symbol H2O. So I think it's a really cool solution. Let's see if you can beat me, Mother Nature. I'm not sure. Well, I've been looking after this planet for millennia and I was keeping the greenhouses gases under control until humans decided to mess with the balance. Mm. And my argument is, if you help me readdress that balance, we can go back to having a healthy and safe planet. Now, I have devised many, many systems for capturing the greenhouse gases. And one of these is 
through planting things like mangroves. OK, so through the planting, you're not only going to create new habitats, you're not only going to be able to protect the places that you have built, but you're also going to be able to capture gases like carbon dioxide. So by employing my solution, you're going to be helping not just the greenhouse effect and not just climate change, but also all of the creatures on the planet. So I would say that this is a far, far superior solution than yours technology. Mm, we'll see. And not only have I created plants that live on the land, but also that live in the oceans. And there are lots and lots of plant life <coughs> like seaweed and algae in the oceans which capture carbon dioxide and store it and again create wonderful habitats where all of the fishes and the mammals can live. OK, so now you've also taken your technology and you've used my solution as demonstrated in this slide here. Perhaps with my technology, I've made it better. <laughs> <laughs> And then we have tree planting, and I'm hoping that all of you out there have done some tree planting at some point in time, because at one point a lot of this world was covered by trees and they were very, very important in keeping that balance between the greenhouse gases and the atmosphere in this world. And so just by planting trees, you are really, really going to help us combat climate change. So I think we need some help. If you know any technologies that your country is using to combat climate change and you want to help me team tech the superior team, <laughs> if you do, please let us know by posting them in the chat. And if you have already taken action by employing something like tree planting, then please put that in the chat too. So think about how you're using nature to solve the problem of climate change. So if you're still undecided upon whether to trust in technology or nature, why not ask our panel of experts for their opinions by posting your questions in the Q&A chat. So you might have a question about a technology solution or a question about using nature to help tackle climate change. OK, so now it's over to you to post your questions in the chat and we're going to give you a little bit of time to do so. And then it will be over to our expert panel to answer your questions. So the ones you posted earlier on climate losses and the ones you're posting now on climate solutions. So we've got some really great questions coming in. We can't wait to have them answered by our expert panel. So we're just going to give you a few more, few more moments to rapidly post your questions in the chat and then we're going to go over to the expert panel who I know are dying to know what your questions are. OK, so we are going to get started with asking the questions to the expert panel. So Joe, would you like to start with a question? I would love to start, Hannah. So this one is from Lumley Junior School in the UK and they ask if we don't get climate change under control, is it possible that we will stop seeing snow? Um, that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, I noticed that you're from County Durham um, and I think, you know, it depends where you're living in the world. So in some parts of the world, Yes, climate change and climate warming probably will mean that you won't see snow anymore. You may have even noticed in the last few winters in, in Durham, we have had a bit, little bit less snow than we had maybe a few decades ago. So I think in Durham, we probably will see less snow. But of course, in other parts of the world, you might not see the effects for, for a few more years or decades. Thank you. So I've got a question from Al Haram Language School in Egypt and they ask, when is the tropical rainforest going to be extinct? I think that's another really, really good question. I think the tropical rainforest is actually very well adapted to the climate in the tropics and it's not going extinct because of anything that's natural. It's going extinct because human beings 
are chopping the forest down and replacing it with other types of trees that they can use for building or for fuels, etc. So it's actually humans who are doing most of the damage for tropical rainforests. Um, and it's difficult to say whether whether it will go extinct completely. It depends on whether human beings keep chopping it down. So I think the more we can do to stop chopping down the rainforest and protecting it and setting up protected areas like big national parks, then obviously we can stop it going extinct. OK, we've got a question and um, it's actually come from two schools, so they've asked this independently. So Neville's Cross and Catchgate would like to know what it will be like if the world's climate breaks down. Uh, I'll answer that. Um, we will face a number of increasing extreme events, so increases in storms, increases in the frequency of drought and also periods of extremely hot weather, which we often refer to as uh, heat waves. And of course, increases in storms not only affect us living on land, they, uh, it uh, affects the oceans as well. So as we've heard, uh, increases in storms may have an impact on coral reefs and coastal uh, ecosystems, leading to also increases in coastal uh, flooding. So simply, uh, with climate change, we expect to see a greater frequency of these extreme uh, events. And of course, we've got to start thinking about ways in which we prepare ourselves to deal with uh, these increases in fre the frequency of extreme events. If I could just add to that as well, as both of those schools were from County Durham, um, I'm sure you're aware that Durham County Council, we, we do a lot of work to help pr uh, protect residents and deal with uh, extreme weather events. We help when there's floods and you'll know that the River Weir that passes through the county quite often floods through Durham City and through Chesterley Street, which are towns that you will know. Um, and we have to take precautions to stop that damaging people's homes. Uh, and then in the winter, we grip the roads to keep the traffic moving and we try and make sure that people still can access their schools and their doctors and their local hospitals. And all of these tasks that we have to do as a local authority to try and keep the county moving and to keep um, general life happening through extreme weather events will become more difficult and will become more expensive to deal with. Um, and in the north of England, we've generally had quite a temperate climate and we know that it's never too hot and it's never too cold. And the things that we've been able to do to, to help people manage through that uh, environment have been really quite achievable and, and quite doable. And we all know that because we live in the county. But this will become increasingly difficult as the climate changes and we see more extreme weather events. And I, I will add to that because uh, most of us live in cities. Uh, 20 to 30 years from now, something like 65 to 70 percent of the world's population will live in cities. And cities are quite unique because they have their own type of climate, which is very different to the surrounding uh, rural areas. And we often talk about the urban heat island effect, and this makes cities much hotter than the countryside. So as climate changes, our cities will become warmer and warmer, and not only because of climate change, but also as our cities grow, we build more buildings, uh, we create more roads, and that also adds to the uh, heat. So we've got two things to worry about, not only climate change, but also how cities are changing our local climate and what we need to do to try and manage those two challenges. Thank you. That's that some really good answers there. So we've had lots of questions come in from schools such as Al Haram Language School, Catchgate on coral reefs. So they want to know if the coral reefs die, do they lose their colour? And what will happen if we can't save the coral reefs? So coral reefs are in danger actually for two reasons. The first one is that the oceans are getting warmer and they're also becoming more acidic and that means that the corals don't like to grow in them anymore. But the other thing that's affecting the corals is that the sea level is rising and of course they like to live a certain water depth 
And as the sea level rises, they quickly, it becomes too dark for them to grow where they like um, on the reef systems offshore. Um, so coral reefs are really in danger. And I think you mentioned in one of the questions there that yes, there's a process known as coral bleaching, which is where they do die. And all those wonderful colors that you see, um, they do actually turn white. Um, and that's a, that's a process known as coral bleaching. So these reefs support a huge amount of, of wildlife, of aquatic life, fishes, et cetera, and crustaceans like to live amongst coral reefs. So as these coral reefs, coral reefs die off, um, unfortunately, we will see a loss of what we call habitat, or these ecosystems will shrink, and that will impact some of those animals that live in them, which will unfortunately die. Thank you. Next question is about the Arctic. So Bowburn and Neville's Cross have both got concerns about the Arctic. One school would like to know how long until the Arctic melts entirely. And the other school has asked a related question of if we don't do anything to help the Arctic, how high will the sea levels rise? OK, so I do a lot of research and I do a lot of teaching in, in the Arctic. So this is a subject that's close to my heart and those are great questions. Um, how quickly will the Arctic melt? Well, it does a little bit depend about what kind of ice you're talking about. So every year there's a thin layer of ice forms over the oceans and we call that sea ice. And we know that that's very, very sensitive to climate change and climate warming. And we know that sea ice, particularly in the summer, is shrinking and shrinking pretty much year on year and we're worried that it might disappear within the next few decades in the summer. So that thin layer of sea ice is, it will, will melt very rapidly. But we also have large uh, glaciers and big sheets of ice in the Arctic. So there's a massive ice sheet that covers the whole of Greenland, which is one of the world's largest islands. And that ice sheet alone stores about seven meters of sea level rise. So if the whole of the ice sheet disappeared, sea levels would rise by about seven meters and scientists have been monitoring it very closely over the last few years and we do know that Greenland is melting um, and it's melting at an accelerating rate so we are quite worried that Greenland could add several centimeters to sea level rise over the next few decades possibly up to half a meter or maybe even a meter by the end of this century but the scientists are also very clear that if we could limit the warming and if we could limit the warming to about one and a half degrees, which was the ideal temperature target for the, the Paris Climate Agreement that you might be aware of, then we could actually protect most of the Greenland ice sheet. So when you ask me how quickly will ice melt, my answer is largely dependent on how human activities or how much human activities put extra greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And if we can limit out those emissions and that pollution, we should be able to protect a lot of ice in the Arctic. But if we don't limit our emissions, then unfortunately we will lose a lot of ice in the Arctic. Thank you. Right. If I could add, add to that, I think we also need to think about the Antarctic, the massive uh, ice sheet in the southern hemisphere. And that is a huge unknown for us in terms of how it will respond to uh, climate change. So even if a small part of the Antarctic ice sheet melts, that will uh, contribute additional uh, sea level rise. Thank you, some really interesting answers there. So we've heard a question from Bowburn and Ribbon Academy in the UK, and they've asked, how long will it take to reverse climate change? Or is it even able to be reversed? Yeah, nice uh, question. That's a very big question, um, and there's many different answers to that to that question. Uh, the simple response is it depends how fast we can implement uh, climate change mitigation uh, strategies. But the climate of the Earth has always changed through our history. We go through uh, very cold periods, the ice ages, and uh, warmer periods, the interglacials. But uh, the rate of climate change we've experienced over the last 100 years has been unprecedented. So the short answer is, if we were able to implement 
all the promises uh, made by governments about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we should be able to slow down the rate of human caused uh, climate change. If we were to turn off all our emissions tomorrow, then we would not halt climate change immediately. That is because the gases, the greenhouse gases uh, caused by human activity remain in the atmosphere for some time. Uh, carbon dioxide has a much shorter uh, life than greenhouse gases like methane. So we are committed to warming for at least 100 years if we have to stop all uh, emissions tomorrow. So just to emphasize again, it's all about how quickly we take action and that will determine how quickly we can slow down human caused climate change. Thank you very much, panel. We're now moving on to some more solution based questions and Neville's Cross would like to know what can we do to make the Arctic as large as it used to be? Well, I, I think that comes back to the to the point that that we've made earlier. It's a great question, but what we can do is try and reduce our emissions and bring them back to where they were, for example, 50 or 60 years ago. Um, and if we can do that, and it should be within our reach with the technology we have available, then there's no reason why we couldn't see many of these habitats and ecosystems um, protected and possibly even grow back to where they were 60 or 70 years ago. Yeah, I will add to that, and this is a, a technology based solution. Some of you may have heard of this idea of geoengineering. This means essentially altering the nature of the, the Earth's atmosphere by putting uh, gases into the Earth's atmosphere that will reduce the amount of incoming energy from the sun. And some people have suggested this geoengineering solution might be able to help control climate change because we reduce the amount of energy coming from the sun. But my personal view is that is a very scary solution because once we start interfering with the Earth's atmosphere in this way, there is the potential that that effect will get out of control. So, you know, geoengineering might be a solution for cooling the planet back down and therefore allowing the Arctic uh, sea ice to uh, re-establish on and so forth. But we don't know the unknown consequences of that kind of solution. Thank you, panel. So we've had a question from St. Charles in the UK and they ask, how can we store energy from solar panels? Because sometimes it produces electricity and we aren't quite ready to use it at that point. So how can we store energy from solar panels? Yes, I'll, I'll answer that question. That's a really good question. Thank you, because that illustrates the point that renewable energy, which doesn't depend on burning fossil fuels, is intermittent. And that means that sometimes we have lots of sunshine or lots of wind energy, and then other times we don't. So solar panels are designed to produce electricity directly from sunlight. So there are different ways that we can store energy. Electricity can be stored in batteries which is one possible uh, approach that sometimes people are using, particularly in developing countries where you might have a small local grid system that has a few solar panels and a battery. We can also store electricity in much larger scale systems. So for example, in the United Kingdom, we have some pumped hydro storage schemes. So that is where water is pumped up to the top of a mountain and then when the electricity is required, the valve is opened and the water flows back down through the pipeline into a generator to produce electricity. We can also think about storing energy through uh, gases. So there's a lot of space under the earth where we have extracted oil or gas or coal. 
and some people are thinking about how we might put compressed air into those spaces and store the air at high pressure and that then allows you when you need the energy to release the air and when it comes back out it generates electricity. So I think those are one possible way of storing energy. But Thank you very much Douglas. Now all of the questions that you have sent to us we're going to be giving to the panel and we're going to be popping the answers out on our ECO2 Smart Schools website. So don't worry if your question hasn't been answered. Um, we've got one last question to go to the panel and we just, they're not there. <laughs> That's all right, we will, we will ask them <laughs> and post the answers on the ECO2 Smart Schools website. So thank you very much panel. I really enjoyed that. There's some really interesting questions and interesting answers that you gave. So schools, now it's time for you to decide. Do you think team technology or nature will be most effective in the fight against climate change. So please click on the link that is being posted in the chat to cast your vote. So will it be team technology? Or will it be mother nature that provides the solutions on climate change? So have a think, are you team technology or team mother nature? Oh, we've got one vote for nature. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I think nature's been doing it for a very long time and has a lot of experience in these matters. See, but a vote has come in for team technology as well. <laughs> I do think technology will help humans maintain their lifestyle though. True, but I think technology will help us to come up with some really interesting solutions. Oh, at the moment it's 50-50, let's see. <laughs> I just think sometimes if you mess with me too much, we'll go completely out of balance. Sometimes technology can help Mother Nature. Keep casting your votes, fantastic. It's very close right now. It is, it's extremely close. There's obviously a lot of debate going on in classrooms as well, which is good. Mother Nature's just got it at the moment. Yes, Mother Nature still just got it, which is good. Oh, but technology is fighting back as well. Oh, it's going to be into the final few votes. I think the general conclusion is if we work together, we're going to do a better job. I think, I think we're right. <laughs> it's nearly 50-50, isn't it? So thank you very much for casting your votes. OK, so. We are going to now be having a look at some of the work that you have completed around climate hopes. And we've been delighted to see that you've been taking action in your schools. So we'd like to have a little look at what you've been posting on the chats, on, on, on your online work that you've been doing leading up to the conference, um, just to inspire you all with the different things that different schools have been doing. Because it's important to remember that there is hope. People all around the world, including children and schools, are taking action against climate change. So if you have any more actions to add on top of the ones we're about to show, then please let us know what you've been up to in the chat. Uh, hello, good morning everybody. My name is Am. Uh, the project subject is Go Green. We need to plant uh, more trees. Why? Because trees give us oxygen and decrease air pollution to keep our uh, uh, planets beautiful and healthy and don't, and don't cut leaves. Thank you. That's a great solution there, planting trees. That's really great for absorbing the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Hello, my name is Nancy. I'll talk about loving Mother Nature. Number one, we shouldn't cut down too much flowers. Number two, we should minimize pollution by using clean sources of energy, like uh, solar energy. 
Number number three, it's better to go by electric cars or bicycles instead of your cars. Yeah, some great solutions there again as well. So taking the bike or using an electric car instead of a car powered by petrol or diesel and solutions such as solar panels and wind turbines providing clean energy as well. OK, then we've got work here shown from Edmondsley Primary School in the UK where they've designed areas in the school that they could develop or improve to become more climate friendly. So as we can see on there, pictures I think they're going to be doing some tree planting and they've made some pledges as well which is wonderful we're going to come on to that later in our conference so a school in Italy they've created a fantastic save the planet poster and included lots of quotes to help people think about why it is important to save our planet so spreading the message is always important to encourage more people to take action and then we've got a school here in France um, and each class had two eco representatives who helped raise awareness <clears throat> about sustainability issues and they had eco clubs that students could join to start taking action. They included reducing things like food waste and growing their own vegetables and plants and they even created um, a laundry that doesn't con contain harmful chemicals and chemicals are very, very um, greenhouse gas intensive to make. So it's really good to reduce the amount of chemicals that we use. And we've got a school in Egypt and they created some beautiful eye catching posters mm -hmm. to show the different futures the earth could have. And they also ran campaigns in their school to remind others to save water. So when we're using hot water, that takes lots of energy to produce and to repair and reuse resources rather than throw them away and buy new ones, which again takes lots of energy to produce. So seeing what you have been up to has really inspired me. So well done for all the fantastic work that you've been doing. And I think we should all try and make one pledge of action that we are going to take against climate change. So I am going to try and cycle more instead of taking my car. And I am going to shorten the time I spend in the shower because I think that is my biggest sin. I like my warm showers. Yes. So reducing that will reduce the amount of energy used to heat that water. So if you let us know your pledge of action in the chat, we'd really like to see what you're going to be up to. So whilst you're doing that, I'm going to remind you about COP. So last year, COP26 took place in Glasgow, UK in November 2021. And at this conference, some countries made new pledges. So just like you're doing now, they made new pledges. And a pledge is a promise of what a country will do to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. And also at COP26, a new report was produced, which shows whether countries are keeping to their promises that they made. And this report found that some countries are keeping to those promises, but some countries aren't. So this year, COP27, so COP is where representatives from countries all around the world get together to talk about climate change. And it will take place this year in Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt in November 2022. So it starts on Sunday um, for two whole weeks. And at COP27, they will try to encourage those countries who are not keeping their promises to take more action so that we can stop our planet from getting much hotter and stop as many impacts from climate change. They will also try to make sure that each country has enough money to take the action that they need to take to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. OK, so now we're going to look at some of the actions that you're already doing and some of the pledges that you're making. So St. Charles in Spennymore says that they have already been planting fruit vegetables and trees. Excellent St. Charles. Fantastic. Lumley Juniors in the UK, they're going to pledge to turn off the lights when they are not using them. That's great. That's going to save lots of energy. 
Then we have Bowburn and they're going to try and use less paper. Very, very important because again, paper is not only cutting down the trees, but using lots of energy and water in its production. And Neville's Cross, they're going to use natural light. So they can try and use natural light instead of switching on the lights, which takes energy. And Edmondsley is going to be like St. Charles and they are going to grow and harvest their own fruit and vegetables on the school grounds. Fantastic. Keep those pledges coming in. Yeah, New Brentsford Primary are going to plant trees and turn the taps off when they're brushing their teeth. Yeah, to save that water that takes energy to produce. Fantastic. Uh, Neville's Cross are going to plant trees and they already have energy saving officers to help them save energy. So that's a good idea, isn't it? Yeah. Give somebody the responsibility to turn those lights off. It's a great idea. You could also do that at home, encourage your family to mm. make sure they switch off their lights as well. Another one from New Brunswick. Some of them are going to cycle to school instead of going by car. Someone says they're going to spend less time on their Xbox, so that will definitely oh, save yeah. energy, won't it? Definitely help. <laughs> We've also in news brands, but they're going to see if they can use electric cars. Um, that's something I would definitely recommend. Um, I've got an electric car myself and it works really, really well. And something to watch for in the future in terms of a solution is I'm pretty sure we're going to be seeing hydrogen cars appearing on the roads very soon. And Lumley Junior School, they're very lucky to have solar panels on their roof to generate electricity, which is fantastic. So it must be really interesting to see those solar panels on your roof. Yes, yeah, so well done Lum Lumley Juniors for making that investment. Um, we've got an anonymous one um, and they're saying that they have a go green campaign, encouraging classes to switch off lights when the class is not in use. Fantastic. Uh, Bowburn Primary are going to try and reduce and reuse and recycle if they can't reduce and reuse um, resources. Fantastic. Yes, because if we all just stopped using as much, it would really, really help in the battle against yes. climate change, wouldn't it? So they're still coming in thick and fast. I think we've got time for a couple more. So Al Haram Language School, they're going to cycle more instead of driving cars. Fantastic. And Bowburn is energy saving and turning off lights and their smart boards. Great. So there's lots and lots of pledges there. I do hope you keep to them. Um, sometimes it is difficult um, to be that little bit greener and take that little bit of extra time and thought, but it's going to help us all in the long run, isn't it? Fantastic. So. Uh, Pro Vice Chancellor Global Claire O'Malley from Durham University is here to thank you for all the hard work that you've been doing during the ECO2 COP27 climate conference. Hello. It's a pleasure for me to formally conclude this COP27 ECO2 Smart Schools Festival. My name is Professor Claire O'Malley and I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor Global at Durham University in the UK. I'm responsible for the university's international work and for our collaborative partnerships with institutions in many other countries. We all know that the energy transition and climate change are the most significant challenges facing our global society today. The annual Conference of Parties, or COP meetings, organised by the United Nations, are where global leaders get together to agree what actions they can take to tackle climate change. However, this isn't just a task for leaders. It's a task for us all. That's why events such as these are so important. We all have a role in making a difference and tackling climate change. I hope that you've learned many new ideas and insights from our experts at Durham University today. Durham is one of the leading universities in the UK and globally. Our experts are researching innovative new approaches and solutions to these challenging problems. They're taking time to educate students and explain these issues more widely through events such as today's live session. I'm delighted that you've been able to learn from them 
and to ask questions and be inspired by their answers. Durham University has many degree programmes that teach students about the complexities of our world, including new renewable energy technologies and what the energy systems of the future will be. So if you've been inspired by today's event, then I encourage you to continue your studies, to learn from your teachers and follow your dreams. Perhaps some of you might one day come to study at Durham, where you would be very welcome. So I'd like to thank everyone who's helped to put today together and our experts who participated in this event today. And most of all, I'd like to thank each of you for participating. The more you and we learn about these issues, the better our shared future will be. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much for coming to the Eco2 COP27 Climate Conference. It's been really nice to have you all here and it's been really inspiring to hear about all of the actions that you've been taking. Um, together, we will definitely make a difference, won't we? And as a school, if you want to make a little bit more difference, remember to become a climate friendly school and to really take advantage of your Eco2 support. So do let us know in the chat if you've enjoyed the conference today. We wish you the best of luck with all those fantastic pledges of action that you've um, shared with us. And if you do take action, we'd love to know. So please email us at eco2smartschools at oases.org.uk. I'll make sure to send that email address through to your teachers so that we can continue to see all the fantastic work that you and your schools are doing. Thank you very much, everybody, and hopefully we will be back again next year. Thank you. Bye.